I want to go back in time. I want to be innocent again. To suspend the moments before that horrible morning at the Tree of Life synagogue. I want to be with the Jews, old Jews, arriving early for services, early for prayer, perhaps out of habit, perhaps compelled by long-remembered German grandparents that insisted everything be on time, or perhaps driven by a desire to serve, to set up and to greet others. Every church, every mosque, every synagogue has people like this. I want to be with them as they made sure the chairs were straight and the Torah scroll was rolled to the right section and they put out the cups and the whiskey for the baby naming. I doubt the churches have that. <laughs> I know the mosques don't have that. <laughs> I want to see the Jews. I want to see the Jews in their tally tote draped in our tradition, wearing the garment of prayer and hope and obligation and community. I want to see the knots that tied them together, the knots that tie them to our people and to a vision for a repaired world. And most of all, I want to be with Cecil and David Rosenthal, the two brothers, 54 and 58 years old, the youngest victims both with intellectual disabilities. I want to be with them as they jump to welcome anyone who enters, ready to hand them a prayer book and tell them the page number. I want to be with them because they stand in the doorway. And with that, we find wisdom. The doorway has always been the place of vulnerability where the safety of the interior meets the unpredictability of the exterior. Every Jew in that synagogue, every Jew in every synagogue knows that vulnerability, that fear. Anti-Semitism, hatred of the Jews is as old as the Pharaoh. And in every generation, it rears its spiteful head looks like so many other minoritized groups in America. Jews have been outsiders. And this terrorist attack disabuses any of us of the illusion that anti-Semitism will disappear in this country. Earlier this week, our teens here at NVHC met to have a conversation about what happened in Pittsburgh. As we looked around the room, 100% of our teens said they had experienced anti-Semitism in our public schools. Thank God this is usually not the extreme violent type of attack, but more latent anti-Semitism. The jokes and the comments, the assumptions and the reminders that we are not the norm and that we are outsiders. Over a century ago, the great African-American thinker W.E.B. Du Bois coined the term double consciousness to describe the need to see oneself simultaneously through our own eyes and as well through the eyes of the rest of the world. All outsiders, all minoritized groups feel this way. We are always standing in the doorway looking at the self that we know and looking outside to see how they see us. This is a form of survival that we learn when we are young. This second awareness, it is a necessary burden that we carry throughout life. And I wonder if Cecil and David Rosenthal carried that awareness with them every Shabbat morning as they stood in the doorway. They saw the door as an opportunity as a place to greet the other. But for some, for some in our society, the doorway is a threat, a place to lock and hide. That is the ideology of the attacker last Saturday. The ideology explains both his fear of immigrants and his fear of Jews. 
Anti-Semitism always morphs to conform to the fear of the time. And in our moment, in our time, that fear has become a fear of immigrants. The fear of those who lie outside our national doorway. We should not be surprised that he believed that a Jewish humanitarian organization that actually helped my wife's grandmother escape Germany in 1937 to go to Colombia, South America, because the doors of America were closed. That same organization, he believed, is the main cause of the waves, the millions of people who want to come to America. He gives the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society a little too much credit. It's a great organization, but his conspiracy theories are fantasy. Since he started with the assumption that all outsiders are dangerous, all diversity a threat, the immigrant, the Jew, and the doorway itself must be destroyed. That is his ideology. So what accounts for the difference between that attacker, that killer, and Cecil and David Rosenthal? It would be too easy to just label him evil and move on. But his actions came in a context, in a worldview, a belief that doorways are dangerous. Why was the same place, the same exact place, the doorway, so different for these two different groups of people? We find the answer as Jews, as we always do, in the Torah portion of the week. What did you expect? I'm a rabbi. <laughs> Each week, the Jewish people read a different section of the five books of Moses. There are 54 sections. Don't ask me why. This week, we are reading Genesis 23, the story of Sarah's death and the need of her husband Abraham to find a burial site. How ironic, this is the reading of the week, a week of funerals. This is a moment of grief and pain and vulnerability. This is a moment every single human being can relate to. But Abraham is also an outsider. He has to approach the local people, the Hittites, and proclaim, I am a resident foreigner, a ger toshav. I am an outsider. And he says, please introduce me to the man Ephron the Hittite, Ephron who owns the cave of Machpelah, because I want to purchase land. Ephron would rather give him the cave, because that would preserve Abraham's outsider status if he is not landed gentry. These ideas go way back. Abraham persists, and they negotiate, and he buys the land. The story seems simple enough, but this is not how Jews read Torah. This is not how we study. Embedded in our tradition is the awareness that every reader sees a different message in every story. Beginning with the rabbis who lived around the time of Jesus, Jews created a tradition of argument, of questioning, debate, and listening to the interpretation of Torah. In one famous story, the rabbis are arguing so loudly that God intervenes and calls down with the answer for them. <laughs> but wait, one of the rabbis looks up at heaven and points a finger quoting Deuteronomy back to God saying, Lo bashamayim he, it is not up in heaven for you to decide, we get to decide. <laughs> the Jews of the Tree of Life synagogue would have, would have looked at this Torah portion and they would have argued, I wish I could be with them and hear it. Maybe one of them would have noticed a funny thing in the text. Maybe they would see that in this short story, the Torah, this document that is so economical with words, repeats seven different times that Abraham and Ephron spoke among the Hittites or in the hearing of the Hittites or with all who entered the gate of the town or before the people of the land. Maybe 
the members of the Tree of Life synagogue would remember that the number seven is the signifier of important things. The old joke is that two Jews have three opinions. And so we could debate all night the meaning of this text. I want to offer this possibility. At the moment when Ephron had to face the outsider, when he stood like Cecil and David in the doorway, facing the outside, this was no longer a private matter. This was a public debate. Abraham and Ephron met out in the open. They were not doing real estate. They were doing politics. And I wonder if I was with those old Jews, draped in their tally tote, reading the text, how they would react to my reading. I can picture them, Jews who read Torah week in and week out. I have seen them my entire life. They look deeply into the book. They whisper to each other. They probably interrupt or disagree. They might tilt their heads or raise their gray, bushy eyebrows and mumble in assent. I cannot tell you what they would say in Pittsburgh, but I know that old Jews would be studying Torah, debating each word, arguing over letters, or even just the strange dots that sometimes appear in the scroll itself. And they would do this next week, and the week after, and the week after that, because that is what Jews do. We go back to the Torah. The synagogue in Pittsburgh was called Tree of Life because the book of Proverbs teaches the Torah is a tree of life to those who hold fast to it. The process of seeking wisdom, of desiring learning and ideas for their own sake, not for the sake of winning an argument, but for the sake of challenging assumptions. This idea, this is how Jews feel alive. How we grow and we change and we reject stagnancy. We do not become ossified in our ideas sitting in front of a computer. This is what brings Cecil and David to the doorway, ready to encounter difference. The shooter, the killer, had none of that. Instead, he had the internet, and he had algorithmically reinforced repetition of ideas already embedded in his head. He was radicalized, just like any terrorist, by sitting in a dark room and reading messages from people who already agree with him. Torah study does not allow us to do this. Torah study is based on an ethic of listening to people who disagree, an ethic that Judaism will not even let God disturb. Lo bashamayim he, the answer is not in heaven, it is with us. We find it together. Studying text deeply shapes the mind. It allows for healthy conversation and to return to the lesson of Abraham and Ephron standing before the Hittites doing politics, we see that our politics needs the lesson of Torah as well. All of those centuries ago, thousands of years ago, when they disagreed about immigrants, they didn't kill each other. They did politics instead. But today, politics is a dirty word. Our politics is broken for the same reason that our country is so obsessed with immigrants. Because we have forgotten how to disagree. We have forgotten how to raise our eyebrows without raising our voices or raising guns. I believe what the military historian Karl von Clausewitz taught. War is the continuation of politics by other means, which means that politics is the prevention of war by other means. Politics is how we disagree without killing each other. All week this week, I have listened to vigils. I have listened to speeches to hear people say, we must heal our politics by, by embracing civility. I want to say tonight, civility is not enough. Civility is not enough when people are so deeply afraid. 
Civility is not enough when the internet amplifies fantasy and radicalizes the population. Civility is not enough when parties and politicians abandon their responsibility and instead pursue power. Civility is not enough when we do not have the courage to be like Ephron and Abraham and discuss our ideas out in the open, especially when we disagree. Civility is wonderful, but it is not enough. In addition to civility, we need habits. We need to be like old Jews who study Torah. Habits that open our souls, that bring us to the doorway of the mind and retrain our society in how to listen, not to talk. How to disagree and how to compromise. That is why here at NVHC, during the Jewish High Holy Days, a few short weeks ago, we embarked on a project to rebuild democracy. We actually called it Rebuilding Democracy. <laughs> Before Pittsburgh, long before Pittsburgh, we had already scheduled one of our first events tomorrow morning. Literally tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., we will be studying a different kind of Torah. We will use the same skills I described earlier, the same skills that Jews have used for thousands of years. We will use those skills and the text will be the Declaration of Independence. And next month, we're going to take on Federalist number 10. Gewalt. <laughs> and after that, maybe we'll do Emma Lazarus or Martin Luther King or W.E.B. Du Bois or I don't know who comes next. In addition, this entire weekend, we will be rebuilding the most basic principle of democracy. We will be getting out the vote with voice. We will go and find the people who have given up on democracy in our own community, the people who do not vote. And we will remind them that their vote has power and power restores hope. And voting prevents violence. Please join us in getting out the vote. You can go to the Voice website after services. Keep your devices off for now. <laughs> and you can get more information there. And we will continue our experiments with democracy, this project of rebuilding all year long and going forward, because I have a firm belief that faith communities like ours, like those represented here on the BIMA by my colleagues, our faith communities are in a unique position to be incubators of democracy and academies of citizenship. I ask this question, who else will do it? Who else in our society can reteach America how to be citizens? How to be like Abraham and Ephron and stand before the community and disagree? Who will teach the habits of devotion, service, deep study, listening, and respect? Who can do this other than us? The habits of study and prayer and deeds of humanity supersede party and policy. Who else but us? We would love for everyone to help with this project, which is why after services you can sign up on clipboards or if you're really fancy, you can use the QR code in the back of your service handout. I don't know how that works. <laughs> We must rebuild our democracy, our politics, because I fear, I fear deeply in my soul that this week of pipe bombs and Squirrel Hill will be just another step on the road from Orlando to Charleston to Quebec to Charlottesville to Sutherland Springs to Jeffersontown, Kentucky to fill in the blank. Who knows what comes next? Maybe Reston, God forbid. Last week, the shooter tried to kill Jews, but he also tried to destroy the doorway, to eliminate the place where we see the outsider not as a threat, but as an opportunity. This is why those who challenge fundamentalist hatred online are trolled and bullied and attacked, because their entire worldview, the worldview of the haters, depends upon absolute certainty that outsiders are dangerous. 
But we know better. We are standing in the doorway. We are looking outward. We are standing with Cecil and David. Because we seek, we seek diverse ideas. And we seek the presence of others. And that is why when we sat down to plan tonight's service, Ken Caro and Rabbi Weiner and I agreed immediately without a moment's hesitation that we needed your presence here tonight. We needed to celebrate Shabbat and do it our Jewish way, but we needed you to be with us. Yes, we need your civility, but even more than that, we need you to be different from us. The Quran teaches that God create us, created us differently so we can learn from each other. We need that difference, and we need you to be here with us. We need the note that a member of the Adam Center, Ibrahim Mois, taped, taped literally to the front door of our synagogue on Saturday afternoon. The note says, Dear neighbors, truly sorry for the hateful, cowardly acts of the terrorist in Pittsburgh. You are all in our prayers, and we will continue to fight to ensure the safety of all, regardless of race, religion, or ethnicity. We need Rizwan Jaka from Adams, who came here on Sunday with his family. With his family, not afraid to be in a synagogue. And we need Kathy Hudgens, who walked here after prayer from St. Thomas at Beckett Church. And all the text messages, and all the calls, and all the emails that we received that flooded our inboxes. Calls from Reverend Berlin of Florida United Methodist and Reverend Smith Cobbs and Messman from Trinity Presbyterian, Reverend Hillary West from Epiphany Episcopal, Reverend Hafner from the Unitarian Church down the street, who also offered her parking lot tonight. <laughs> we need the support we feel from all the clergy and all the churches who are here. Reverend Julie Wilson Black of Fairlington Presbyterian, Pastor Ettoria V. Goggins and Reverends Pauline J Johnson and Lillian Moore of the First AME Church in Manassas. Reverend Bob Vaughn of Community of Faith United Methodist, Reverends Beth Williams and Marcus Leathers from United Christian Paris right down the street in Reston. We need Tim Ward from Restoration Church here in Reston, Tim Barwick from St. Anne's Episcopal, and of course we need our neighbors, our neighbors from St. Thomas of Beckett that have been with us our entire history as a congregation. And we also appreciate so deeply the strong support from the Fairfax County Police that have been with us all week. From Supervisor Hudgens and Senator Howell and Delegate Plum and any other elected officials who might be here, I don't know who you are. And we hope all of the people I just mentioned, and if there's anyone I missed who are clergy, please, at the end of the service, at our closing song, we'd like you to join us up here on the Bema in this room. So if you're in another room, come join us as we sing together. All of you bring us healing, not only because we feel your comfort as this is a house of bereavement, but because you affirm a vision of America, a vision that brings Jews and Christians and Muslims, whites and blacks, native born and immigrant, gay and straight, all of us together as human beings and as Americans. I love this country. Only in this country, in America, can this kind of thing happen that's been happening at this synagogue and synagogues all over the country right now. Only in this country can this happen. We need you in this room. Only in this country can this room be a place of prayer for both the Jewish community and the Adam Center, which prays here every single Friday. We need you to be here doing Jewish stuff with us tonight. We need you stumbling over the Hebrew, wondering why the book goes backward. <laughs> we need you meeting strangers. We want you to see our home, to be in our place and see us as we are. We have nothing to hide. The conspiracy theories are wrong. And we want to come visit you in your home too. Because with our presence together, we reject the hatred of the Jews and we reject the hatred of closed and locked doors. We want you here with us. This is how we reject and defeat the fundamentalist worldview of closed minds. 
This is how we hold fast to the tree of life. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom. Thanks.